All right, so we are just, uh, we're going to finish Mark, not today, but we're, we're working there, 16 chapters, and uh, last week we uh, were talking about figs, <laughs> and you know, we, we got to that, I just want to back up just a little bit, we ended at, uh, on, on 192 here right now, I'm looking at, and uh, so we are... We were finishing up chat. We finished up chapter 11 last last week, and uh, we uh, spent some time on the business of the uh, of the, the fig tree when the Lord cursed it, and uh, as He was walking uh, along, and it didn't have any figs on it, and had some had some statement there that was kind of difficult to quite understand. Uh, you know, it said the time of the figs was not yet. I was thinking about that, and I'm thinking this was probably a, a not a, brand, a new fig tree, but probably a mature fig tree. And when the Lord said that, it is possible that that fig tree in, in years past had never produced fruit. You know, and so uh, and so maybe it, maybe it should, maybe it should have had. Well, anyway, we know that Peter, <laughs> you know, bless his heart, he's always you know. He, wants to question the Lord about the fig, the fig tree. And he points out to the Lord, that fig tree, look at it. It's just like you said it was cursed. Imagine that. And, and the Lord takes that opportunity to tell, to tell Peter that he shouldn't have imagined it. He should have knew that when the Lord said it was cursed, it was cursed. Because when the God says something, it, it is what, what he says. And the problem was that Peter didn't have enough faith at that point in time into who the Lord Jesus Christ actually was. He called him master uh, during this, uh, this dialogue. He did not call him Lord. And the, and the Lord points out to him that this is something, that cursing is something that only God could do. And since I did it, Peter, you should have known, you should know by now that I am God in the flesh. You may not understand all about that neither do we but that was the, that was the case and i think that's one of the reasons uh that uh you know the lord took that opportunity to point that out and so it wasn't about figs it was about faith and in the book that you gave us to read did you pick up on that lesson one day this week when they were talking about lord and no and i didn't No, that's you that you gotta be careful about those books like no, I, I haven't been reading that book recently, frankly. I haven't. But uh it's the best of the ones that I know. But the people that have been doing that for years, uh, the Morrises, they've died off. And uh J John Morris the third is gone now and so new new people are coming in that are not part of the family. You just don't know what you're gonna get. You, you know what you're going to get when you read your Bible. Yeah. It doesn't change, but those things. So uh, you know, once they start to drift away from people I'm comfortable with, I stop. I stop. I stop. I just stopped using it. I use this. Yeah. I try to spend more time in this. You yeah. 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 But picking up on it, I mean, it's good because yeah, it's master and lord are not. Master and lord are not the same thing. Yeah. Master is, means re, it's a, a it's a title of respect. You talk, it's rabbi or teacher, you know, and, but it is not the same as Lord. And so uh, that's you know that's kind of the way the the subtleties of the way error gets in, into people's minds and into their heart. Well, Jesus answering said unto them, "Have faith in God." So that's that's where and he talked. Then I gave him he gave him the example that said, if you had enough faith, you could move a mountain. And we say, well, he's just using that like we would use, you know, you know, hyperbole. We would stretch the fish was this long. We, you know, we're just trying. But it's not. I believe he, you know, God, the, the Lord doesn't say things like that and not explain them. If he said, if you had enough faith, you could move a mountain, I believe you could move a mountain. But, the problem, you know, but you have to be in the will of God. It's, you're not going to move that mountain unless God would want you to move that mountain. But if he did and you had the faith, you could, he could do it. 
And so he was talking about, uh, I think that was the idea there. He was, t he was basically telling Peter and the, everybody else that was listening, this was not a private conversation, that they didn't have enough faith, even though all the miracles that he'd already done, you know, he's coming at the end of his earthly ministry. This is, this is three years down the road from them walking with him day in and day out for three years. That's a, that's a college education, right? Three, almost, you know, if you're, go, you're going summers, you can have a four-year college education in three years if you go summers. And they had basically had gone to school with him for three years, and yet they were still really dull in their thinking after all that time. And so uh, he's pointing that out, out to them. Um, Well, I don't know if you could. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I would do that inter interpretation, Sharon, because I don't think we can make other people. No, we're not making them, but they might be internally. They're ready. Well, of course. Uh, they seem to be immovable, but yet they. they well, God's word. Will, God's, God's word and the Holy Spirit will will uh, move me. I mean, I was I was 46 46 years old. I had had a complete na complete naval career. I had done all the said all the rotten things that sailors said all through all those years. I mean, mine, and 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 uh, I had been going to this uh, this uh, kind of outreach thing on Sunday evenings. We had kids and drug programs. All that was going on. I was at my wit's end, Marge was at her wit's end. We didn't have answers to all the problems going on in our home. I mean, we were out coming home in the van. I said, Lord, I want you to take control of my life. And I just sat back in the, I was driving too. I mean, I was talking to him while I was driving. I just sat back in the seat and I said, you know, basically said, it's, it's, you got it. And all, things were just started to change. I mean, like overnight, my, my thinking changed. And, and it was because I had heard the word, I would heard that uh, the church, I never went back to that church because it was really not, n not doctrinally sound in, every, in everything. But anyway, so uh, he gives them that little lesson in faith and, and tries to correct their thinking. And, and you know, uh, they don't know he's about to go off the scene. I mean, they are thinking they've got a long-term relationship here going on. This is going to be friends forever, you know, on earth. Not not going to happen. And in verse 27 on page 191, and they come into Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, there came to him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And they, you know, and uh, they're, they're always addressing him. They're, tr they're always confronting him. They're always trying to get him to say something that they can use against him, uh, take words, take words out of context. But the thing that he was doing, and I believe he was doing this from the very first time of his ministry, was he would go into the temple, and if there were people selling uh, merchandise there in the temple, he would drive them out. Remember, the first time he did that was not, not in our current study. It was back right after the wedding at Cana where he turned the water into wine. That was the first miracle he did and, uh, that's recorded here in the Bible. And so that would have been almost, that would have been three years prior to, to our current time. So I believe that every time he went to, that, to the temple, and I, he didn't go daily, he would go from time to time. Every time he went, if they were in there selling and changing money, he'd drive them out. He'd turn over their table, and so they, and they would, but they were afraid of him. They were afraid of him because they knew of the miracles. They knew that the people around him were followers of him, not for faith, but for the miracles. I mean, it's like they were like following their favorite baseball player. You know, I mean, they were, you know, they they were following him, and they would have, you know, uh, opposed anybody that would have tried to to harm him, not because they believed that he was the Messiah, but but they believed he would, he could heal. And, it, and he had miracles, and he taught well. So, and we'll get to that a little bit because they're they're fickle, they're a fickle group of people. Most of them, not, 
not all the, not the disciples, not the, the twelve, but the, the the large the large group. And so uh, they uh, they they get, come there to him. Let's see, I'm going to the bottom of page one ninety one, and say unto him, By what authority? So they, they come to him, and now they're asking, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority to do these things? And so. Uh, the, 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 the teaching and the preaching, they were concerned about that too because he taught as what? One having authority. He didn't teach as, as someone who was always, re, always referencing somebody else's opinion. You know, you get a lot of that from pulpits today. They get up and they say, well, Dr. So-and-so said this or Pastor So-and-so said that or Evangelist So-and-so said this. And uh, they give you a lot of that and nothing out of the book. He spoke about things in the book, and and uh, many of them would know. He's he's teach, he's not he's not referencing any rabbi. He's he knows he knows, and of course it's Old Testament, and he would give them all all this information and give them understanding, and so you know he he would always have a crowd, and they they didn't like that. They were losing control of their of their of their of the people uh, around them, the religious people. Uh, it was the it was the Jews' responsibility. It was the Levites' responsibility, and the priest, uh, specifically the tribe of Levi, had been given the responsibility to take care of the tabernacle and then the temple. So it was their responsibility to see that things were being done right in the temple. The problem was they had corrupted everything in the temple. <laughs> you know, they they were part and parcel to these people selling all this. They were probably getting a cut off the top. There was a, a charge for doing that. This was a money-making scheme for them. And so they're confronting him. I mean, he's upsetting, literally, upsetting their apple cart, <laughs> you know, knocking it over. And they, say, and they said, in, uh, that's where we ended up last week, who gave thee this authority to do these things? So they're, they're questioning his, his right to do what he was doing. Verse 29, page 192. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask of you one question and answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. So he answers their question with a question of his own. I will answer your question if you will answer my question. And so what is the question that he's going to, going to ask them? Now this was a public setting. This was not a private private conversation. So it's the Lord and the disciples, the, the Pharisees, the priests, some Levites, some scribes, uh, and then there's other people around. This is a public setting. So uh, two questions have been asked, one by, one by the, uh, the priests and the Pharisees and the other by the Lord. And it's going to be a public question and now to give a public answer. So what's the Lord? He says, yeah, I'm going to ask you a question first. Verse 30, the baptism of John, and we're talking about John the Baptist here. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? Answer me. Well, a little bit about John the Baptist. What was John the Baptist's mission? In Malachi chapter 3, Old Testament, now verses 1 to 3, Behold, I will send my messenger. And he shall prepare the way for me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them of gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering of righteous, in righteousness. So John the Baptist was, and we're talking about the, the Messiah here, John the Baptist was the forerunner of the Messiah. He was the herald. He was the one that was going to announce uh, when the, uh, uh, or point out the Messiah. Well, how do we know all that? Well, we know from our study of Daniel and, and his 70th weeks, that this is the time in history when the Messiah should appear on, on, uh, in Jerusalem and in, in Judea. And many of the Jews knew that. So they were looking for the Messiah. And uh, so 
And, and now John comes, and, and he looks like who? He looks like the old. Uh, he looks like old Elijah. <laughs> he's dressed like Elijah, and he's he's got the the chutzpah <laughs> of Elijah. I mean, he's he's fearless. I mean, he's he's one person in, in the spirit of the, with the Holy Spirit, and he's telling these people to repent of their sin and trust in the Messiah to come. And and he's basically he's called the uh, religious leaders of the day a bunch of vipers. And and, and uh, you know he's he's laying the wood to their you know to them about they're they're nothing but a bunch of fakers, and so he's there. And then at some point in time, he's the one that points out and says, "Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world." And he points to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's talking about the baptism of John. What was it? The baptism of John was a physical baptism. They did it in, mostly in the Jordan River, and it was a baptism of repentance. It, in other words, people were saying they were, were going to repent of their sin, repent of whatever. There was a lot of dialogue we don't have, I mean, that went on between John and his disciples and these people. But they were basically uh, uh, physically declaring in a public way that they were repenting of their sins and, and a lot of it would be the believing in the works of, of the Pharisees and stuff and believing in the Messiah to come. And uh, so in, uh, let's say here in, in verse 31, and they reasoned, so, uh, they reasoned in themselves saying, if we shall say it from heaven, he will say, why did ye not believe him? So some of those listening would certainly have knowledge of Malachi's prophecy regarding John and who would follow after him, which would be the Messiah. If they believed John, then they would, then they followed the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Remember, John said, in John, uh, uh, John said, the Baptist said in John chapter one verse twenty-nine. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And in John chapter one verse and thirty-six, and looking upon Jesus as he walked. He said, Behold the Lamb of God. And so all this is going on. This is the time frame we're in now. All this is going on. The Lord's on the scene. He's been baptized by John. Uh, to, uh, and uh, that in itself is kind of interesting. And all this is going on. And th three years down the road now. And uh, so he's asking these uh, Pharisees, Why didn't you believe what John the Baptist said? And uh, they have a problem now <laughs> because the people believe what John the Baptist said. So in verse 32, they said, now this is the thinking of the Pharisees, the religious leaders. But if we say of men, they feared the people. For all, the, all, for all men counted John that he was a prophet indeed. So if they said John, basically said John was a faker, they were, they were in fear of their lives because the crowd probably would have done something bad to them and so they said and so they uh, he said why did you not believe him but if we say of men they feared the Lord for they count for all men counted John that he was a prophet indeed John was a prophet and this is what he came for John 1 7 the, the same came for a witness to bear the witness of the light that all men through him might believe who is the light? That would be the Lord Jesus Christ, the light of the world. The religious leaders rejected John's message. They rejected it. They told the people that's not true. And uh, just as they were rejecting Jesus' message, the, the message of the kingdom that he preached, they did not openly deny that John was a prophet, but they, had, but they gave him no value in his messages. Their discussion was not... Their, their discussion was not in search of truth. They were not here to find out the truth. They were here to find some fault. Verse 33, and they answered and said unto Jesus, we can't tell. We can't tell. And Jesus answered and said unto them, neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. If you won't answer my question, I'm not going to answer your question. Uh, they vote. They basically vote as many people do when they they don't want to make it. Don't they want to straddle the fence. They vote present. I mean, you can do that. You can in, in a in a meeting, 
you can vo vote neither yay nor you can vote present. And so that's exactly what they did, which is to take no position on the issue. In Isaiah 29 and verse 14, Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. They were not seeking truth, and, uh, but rather an occasion to catch him in some dialogue that they could take out of context and use against him. He was not having any part of that. The world does that every day. You see, turn on the news. It doesn't take you long to find somebody accusing, just plain accusing somebody of something that has no... And it's, it goes in all directions. And so uh, we get into chapter 12, verse 1, page 194, and he begins the same situation. He's there. It's the same group of people around. Uh, the, the conversations are not done yet. And he began to speak to them by parables. A certain man planted a, a vineyard and set up set a hedge about it and digged a place for the wine fat and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. So now he's going to tell, talk a parable. A parable, what is a, is a, uh, is a story or a, a, it's a story uh, that involves things that the people would regularly understand. He talks about, it's an agricultural environment in those days, farmers, uh, sheep herders, that, that type of thing. So they would uh, understand uh, what is about to be said in the physical sense. But a parable, usually a parable never names names. If you go through this parable, it will never name names. And there is a, a passage of scripture that talks about uh, the rich man and Lazarus and one going to hell and one going to heaven and Lazarus. And, and that's not a parable. Uh, that's 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 a true that's a true story. Lazarus is, is a, was a real person, and so. But here, this is a parable, and we're told that he speaks, is, is, and we're told that it is a parable. And he began to speak to the crowd by parables, unto the crowd, but especially to the religious leaders. And uh, in Matthew thirteen thirteen, therefore I speak unto them in parables, because seeing they see not. And hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. So they, they, they wouldn't understand the plain truth at all. So he's going to teach them it using a parable as, or as, as an example. And you, you will see as we get to the end of the lesson, they get the point. So uh, a certain man, uh, I think he's, uh, the certain man, I believe, is God the Father, planted a garden. So this is, I'm showing you what I think the relationship here is. I think the husband, the, the person, person, the uh, uh, certain man planted a garden. I think they're talking about God. And I believe this vineyard is really, uh, a, is, is really Israel. Uh, this is a, uh, a reference to the nation of Israel. In Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, And I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved had the vineyard a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered it out of the stones thereof and planted it with his choicest vine. By the way, the Jews at this point in time should understand this from Isaiah. I mean, Isaiah wrote back in the 500 years before what's going on here. So this passage of Isaiah should, be, should have been familiar to those in the crowd. So... Uh, so this is uh, so Isaiah had said that built a tower in the midst of also made a wine press therein and he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes and and now O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah judge I pray thee betwixt me and my vineyard what could I have done more to my vineyard than I have done to it wherefore when I look I look that it should bring forth grapes it brought forth wild grapes and and go now to I will tell you what I will do 
to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns, and I will also command clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for the righteous, but behold, a cry. So now, this, okay, that was what Isaiah said 500 years before that. So now the Lord is using, he says a parable, and he's talking about a vineyard. And if some of those Pharisees were smart right then and there, they're thinking, he's talking about a vineyard, but he's talking about us. He's talking about Israel. And some of them would probably would understand that, maybe not all, certainly. So he set a hedge about it. So the hedge may have been something of thick thorns designed to keep things out of the vineyard. Uh, like a good bougainvillea fence. I mean, that'll, that'll certainly discourage uh, people, <laughs> certainly discourage people from coming in. Uh, so also the law, uh, was the law given to the nation of Israel to keep them separate from the rest of the world. They were supposed to be a separated people. I mean, really separated. Uh, it wasn't that they didn't have any contact with the outside world, but as far as their their, their marriages and as far as their business relations, it was supposed to be separate. And uh, they were supposed to be, they were separated from the world, at least in the beginning. And he digged a place for the wine fat. Uh, this would be the center of activity of the vineyard. And you can kind of be thinking about Jerusalem there. This is where the grapes are brought to be pressed and the juice captured in the wine vat. So also was Jerusalem the religious center of the nation of Israel. And they built a tower. So the tower, uh, perhaps the temple where the priests and the scribes were to teach, where the sacrifices were offered. And he let out husbandmen. So these are people that uh, were to, pr to practice or to, to prune and to take care and weed and, and fertilize and water and everything, to take care of the vineyard. Uh, to the Jew religious leaders, national leaders, and I think also the common people. Everybody has, has a responsibility to do something in there. And he went out to a far country. So the, the person who created the vineyard, who set up the vineyard, he, he lends it out, he sets, puts other people in charge of it, and he goes away to a far, far country. Let means to rent, right? Yeah. He let it out to the yeah. government, so he rented it. Yeah, they, well, it, it, yeah, it, they, were, they were like sharecroppers, I guess. Yeah. They would be paid for what they were doing, but, the, but there would be, I would think they probably didn't give it in grapes. They probably made wine. The wine was probably sold, and there was a certain amount that the, 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 uh, the owner would, would gather. Divide the, divide the profits, yeah. So he went to a far, far, uh, into a far country, rightfully expecting that they would be good stewards of possession. You know, and you, you hire people to do a job. You, you try to, you know, you expect them to do, you know, a, 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 do a, a good job. And now the church. Now uh, here again, the, the church is not Israel here. We're talking about the, Israel, the nation here. Israel are Jews, and their future promises are earthly. All of Israel's promises are earthly. What are the Jews today looking for? They're looking for their, their, their Messiah to come in and reestablish them in the land, not the land that they have now, but in the land that uh, was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which is a lot more land than they're presently in. That's what they're looking for the Messiah to do. Uh, they, they, they deny that he's come. The church is a spiritual body. We have, we are not promised any land here on earth. Uh, we're not like the Jehovah who witnesses to think, you know, that the, the church is not, is, is not the number of people in the pews. Uh, it, it should be, but regret, regrettably, few people in church today, in church pews today are born again. That's, they're just not. And, uh, they are religious participants attending services for a variety of reasons. 
even a Bible believing, even Bible believing and practicing churches, people are welcomed into the body who are not truly born again. Uh, it's it's amazing how quickly somebody can join a church, because people are desperate to get people into the body. But pretty soon you find out these people aren't born again. They're not. They're not true Christians. Uh, they got habits that are not. Uh, Christ-like and, and uh, reflect poorly on him and uh, often it's, they do damage to the church and uh, so you know the first church I went in after I got saved was a Baptist church back in Virginia and uh, the first thing when we wanted to join the church we were there a while and we then went and told the pastor and they, we wanted to join the church they said, fine, you, have, you attend our new, new members class. And the new members class was not a one hour session. It went on for a good number of five, six, seven, eight weeks. They went through the, through the entire church constitution, everything that that church believed, paragraph by paragraph, sentence by sentence, questions asked, questions, things, and uh, and so uh, it was only after we went through all of that that uh, and we agreed to it, and we agreed to it, mm -hmm. and we kind of uh, sat down and said what we thought we might be able to contribute to the church, not in dollars, that was never an issue, but our, in, in our talents, were we willing to work, serve, you know, and, and we said we were, and so we were accepted. <laughs> Later on, I became the person that held that class. And I had a, and people would come in, and I had a fellow come in, the class, and he was kind of, kind of rough, and uh, we went through the class, and he, uh, our covenant, our covenant said we would not use alcoholic beverages, uh, for, what's the word I wanted to use for, uh, except for, it, it, it would not use alcohol except if it was for if it was part of medicine. I mean, you get some medicine to have alcohol. We would not use it as a social thing in any manner. None of it. No. And he took issue with that. He liked his beer. So he argued about it. And I said, well, uh, he said, well, I don't see anything wrong with nothing. I said, I said that, you're right. This book did not say anything about your beer. Our Constitution says something about it. I'm asking you, you have to agree with what we've agreed with so that we're like-minded. He didn't like that. And he said, well, I don't agree with that. I, so, I, so I said, this is where we're coming to now. I says, if you don't agree with this, then I will not recommend you for membership. <laughs> if you agree with this, then I expect you to. Did he agree? Did he? And he did. He took, he did away with it, but I'll tell you, it was nose to nose uh, because he was not happy. But I told him, he kept putting it, I said, it's not about this. It's about what our Constitution agrees to. So we have, you know, and uh, we don't do that anymore. You know, people say, we want to join, we've read the book, we agree. They haven't read the book, and they, you know, and they don't know what they're agreeing to half the time. So I didn't mean to get off on that, but that's why we have churches that are so messed up because they're filled with unbelievers, many of whom have got church responsibilities and lead in crazy directions. Anyway, sorry about that. Verse 2, and at the season he sent to the husband and the servant that he might receive from the husband of the fruit of the vineyard. So here again now, this is uh, harvest time, uh, the grapes have been picked. Uh, they have been pressed, and now he, he's sending his servant to get his portion, having let it out. And uh, you know this is going to happen year after year. They're they're, uh, they're they're sharing in the crop. In Matthew's his verse in Matthew twenty one thirty four, there, and when the time of the fruit grew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits thereof. And they caught him, so uh, it's, uh, they caught him, caught the one servant, I guess, and beat him and sent him away empty. <laughs> you know, and so uh, uh, the uh, in Luke's account, chapter 20, verse 10, and at the season he sent a servant to the husbandman that they should give him the fruit of the vineyard, but the husbandman beat him and sent him away empty. This servant and others that follow him typify the prophets that the Lord sent to Israel. Remember, you know, 
have said in advance, this is a, a parable using, <coughs> using grapes and, and husbandmen and servants and stuff, but it's really a, 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 a reflection of, of Israel. Israel was created by God. It was God's, he pulled them out of Egypt and created the nation. He created the nation of Israel. And so they belong to him. And so they, the fruit that, the, what is the fruit that they're supposed to produce? Righteousness. And, and uh, they're supposed to obey the law. And they, and so, uh, and of course they'd get away. So he would send, the Lord would send prophets to Israel. Pro Israel had a, a lot of prophets sent to them. They were sent time and time again to the people they should, that they should repent, that they should turn from their idols and the wickedness of, of the world and bear fruit, meat for repentance. Remember, he would tell them, the prophets would go, you had Elijah, you had Elisha, you had Samuel, uh, you had uh, Nathan, you had uh, all these, these pro and probably many more, Obadiah, remember that was Ahab's prophet that hid people in a cave. Uh, you had all these prophets that were being sent to try to get the people back on track. Isaiah was a prophet. Uh, Daniel was a prophet, a writing prophet, Nehemiah, Ezra. Uh, these were all prophets sent to get the people back on track. And so, uh, but now the message, uh, uh, but they would, they, would, uh, they would change for a little bit and then they go right back to doing what they were doing, you know, when the prophet was, was gone or out of sight. The message was rejected in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 29. And uh, so Nehemiah had this to say and testified against them that they might just bring them again unto the law. They weren't obeying the law, the, the Old Testament law, that they dealt pr proudfully and hearkened not to thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. And withdrew the shoulder, hardened their neck, and would not hear. Yet many years did thou forbear them and testify against them by thy spirit in thy prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore gave us them into the hand of the people of the lands. You know, that's why they went in. They would not listen to what the prophets, prophets would say. Now in Christ's time, uh, John the Baptist was a prophet, but now you've got, you've got the temple, you've got the people in Jerusalem, you've got these uh, religious leaders who were supposed to be the leaders, leaders is the word. They're supposed to be leading the people in the right direction. And the Lord's using this uh, parable to point out today. So where is Christendom? Where is Christendom today? I call, to me, uh, I interpret Christendom as the body of people who claim to be or associated themselves as a Christian. I think the vast majority of whom are not. I mean, you've got millions of people who claim to be Christians claim to be Christians. You ask them if they're a Christian, yeah, my mom and dad were, I went to such and such a church and, you know, they were Christians, so I'm a Christian. That, that's how they would think. Uh, of course, that's not true not in the tr true sense, but they identify themselves with Christianity. Verse 4, and again he sent unto them another servant. So here's the parable. And at, at, and at him they cast stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully shamefully handled. They, some of the, uh, look what they did to Jeremiah. You know, talk about a prophet that got a, a bum. The Lord gave him a ministry and told Jeremiah, this is what you're to preach to these people. And by the way, I'm telling you right now, they're not going to listen to you. He told them that right up front. And, <laughs> and for 40 years, Jeremiah, uh, they put him in a well. They wanted to kill him. Even his own family wanted to kill him. And uh, they try, and they they tried again and again and again because he kept telling them judgment was coming and they didn't want to believe it. Judgment came. They got and they got hauled off to Babylon. And Je Jeremiah, well, he wound up in Egypt actually. But and so uh, they uh, they they treated some of them. They killed. Uh, I mean, there's we don't have all the details on that, except that it happened. So when we do something in the name of the Lord, you know, when we do something in the name of the Lord, how do we reflect on him? I mean, we are his ambassadors now, right? We are, if you're born again, child of God, you are an ambassador. And an ambassador 
is someone who goes and, and gives uh, out information or uh, does things in the name of, of the person who sent them. And Christ is our sender. And so they said in verse 4, and then down here it says at the bottom there, when we do so, okay, in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether we therefore eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. From the basic things we do to the most impactful things we do, you know, so, uh, all should be done to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.17, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Colossians 3.23, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, especially in the workplace. Now, many of us, not all of us are out of the workplace, so, but that's an important place to, to you do it. You know, you don't, you don't turn your Christianity off at 8 in the morning and then turn it back on at 5 or whenever you leave the office. You, you carry it there. I found that people don't like it. You know, you, you start going to meetings and the name of the Lord is being used and sometimes you, you mention it to them. They really don't like it. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, when, the, when you're around them, they tend to not use the language. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. they, t they, they tend not to use it. Right. And so, and verse 5 on page 197, and, he, and again he sent another and they killed him and many others beating some and killing some. So, I mean, they were, they were handling his, his servants, the people that repre represented him. Uh, they were in a very violent and shameful way. Uh, before we continue here, we do see that in the parable how long suffering how long-suffering the Lord of the vineyard is in trying time and time again to just collect what was due him. He's just sending people to collect what was due him. He's not taking it all. He's not, take, he's not make, making them, taking them out. He's leaving, leaving them in the vineyard to work and to share in the, share in the harvest. And, to, and he's just going to receive what, what he's due. That's all he's doing. And they're killing, beating his prophets and killing his prophets. And he's just doing it. That's long suffering. He's, he's being very patient with these people. You know, some people, the first time it happens, you know, the army would go in and clean them out. But this, this is a picture of our Lord, too. Our God is very long-suffering with us. He's very patient with us. Uh, and so in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. This is the, the very end of that book. Fear not and keep the commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good or whether it be evil. So, you know, that kind of wraps up, you know, the whole duty of, of man is to fear God, reference him, and godly fear too, you know, as you would, you know, he, he can punish. You don't like, you don't want him to punish. And so, again, here again, he sends this, uh, in our, back to our parable there, and again, he sent another and they killed him and many others, beating some and killing some. How bad did it get? <laughs> I mean, it really got bad. And uh, the Lord's speaking to the religious leaders here. He's, uh, you know, he's pointing out what, not necessarily what they personally did, but their forefathers, those group of people who they came up out of. Uh, and so Matthew 23, verse 35, that upon you, now he's talking to the religious leaders, that upon you may come all the righteous blood upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, the son of Berechias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. So uh, these religious leaders uh, that he's talking to now, I, you know, I don't, of course, it's a Roman rule as, in, as a nation. The Romans were in, in control of that part of the earth at that point in time. But the Jews did have a certain amount of autonomy to rule their own people within the Roman rule. Uh, and so uh, these religious leaders, 
Uh, they did some awful things, especially to widows. They would steal the land basically from them. And apparently they may have had, they may have had stone, killed people who uh, didn't uh, get in line. I mean, he's accusing them of, of bloodletting here. Verse 6, having yet therefore one son, one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, they will reverence my son. So he's not sending any servants anymore. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't get the job done. So we have uh, having yet therefore one son. Now, you, you can read over that, but that little word there, yet. He says yet. Having yet therefore one son. So I look at that little word. It leaves open to some thinking that there could be other sons in the future. Well, let's look at 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. All true believers are sons of God. I just thought that little word yet there was actually pointing to the time after the crucifixion and the resurrection that there would be more sons. And I mean, it's just a little, little subtle little words there. You just you can just jump over that and never see that. Okay. And so, uh, but this son would always be special. This, this back to our parable. This would be a special son. He was he was called well beloved. That uh, word there, uh, deeply beloved. The Greek word there, apagat. Apagatos. It's agape is the word. Apagat, yeah, agape is the, the kind of love. Uh, but that's a tough one for me. Deeply beloved to love to love someone dearly. Matthew 3.17, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, and on whom I am well pleased. Remember when he come up out of the water? He said, My beloved Son, his well-beloved. So we can see the relationship of the parable to, to real people, real beings, <coughs> real beings. He sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my Son. Note the preciousness of the Son, his only Son and his well-beloved son. The son was very beloved of the father. The father expected the husbandman to respect his son as they would have respected him. These are people to whom the father gave work to do. These are people to whom the father gave work to do from which they would be rewarded when the grapes had been harvested and pressed. These people were, were workers for the, were workers for the for the father, they were workers who were ex uh, expected to produce some fruit for the fathers as well as for themselves. But those husbandmen, in verse 7, said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. How are we doing on time there? Five minutes. Yeah. Okay. So the husbandmen, uh, those husbandmen, the people that were managing and, and working the vineyard said amongst themselves conspiring as evil men do and against those who who did good unto them it's amazing <laughs> this husband and the the the, uh, the uh, owner of the vineyard gave them work to do gave them a job gave them a livelihood and uh, it was his vineyard his his vines his land and uh, they would just work it and uh in Acts chapter 7, verse 52, Which of the prophets have you not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and the murderers. You know, that, that was, uh, it was Acts is after the, the, the resurrection, and Paul and Peter speaking, speak, Peter speaking, uh, and Stephen. I mean, what they do to poor Stephen? They, they stoned him. Yeah, so they, the bloodletting continued on. This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance is ours. Since, since this was the only son at, at this point in time, when the father died, there would be no heir to claim the land. 
the, the women did not inherit the land. So if there were daughters, they would not inherit the land. It was the son. So the land, there would be no heir. And, and so the, uh, they would be able to claim, could claim the land. In John chapter 11, uh, thinking just a little bit forward now of this, uh, this is the high priest Caiaphas speaking to the, uh, you know, they, they want to kill Jesus. They want him dead. And so he says this, nor consider it that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. They were talking, they were thinking about losing their control over, over, the, over the Israelite people. If, if they didn't get Christ off the scene, they were continually losing people to him and they wanted him off the scenes. They, they, they were afraid they're gonna lose their job. And he said unto them, now verse 18 of John, uh, chapter 18, verse 14, now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. They had to figure out a way, they had to figure out a way that the Christ could get, be killed and that the people would be a part and party to it. Same people that were saying, Hosanna, the same people. How easy, they're turned. One week's time. One week's time. And they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. This is the son, we're back in the parable. The, the only son was not well received. He was, he was seized with violence, I believe and killed the Lord. The Lord is talking about what the religious leaders and the people are going to do to him. <laughs> He's talking about what they're going to do to him. And cast out of the vineyard, the Lord was crucified on a hill called Calvary outside the city of Jerusalem. And uh, Hebrews 13, 12, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate, outside the outside. So this whole parable is about is 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 addressed to these religious leaders, and it's 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 a, things that are that have taken place and are about to take place in history during this period of time. Verse nine, there, what there, and uh, verse nine, what shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? Will he come and destroy the husbandman, and will he give the vineyard unto others? Matthew twenty one twenty. When those when the Lord of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto this? What will what's he going to do? I mean, he has been very patient, long suffering with them up to this point. But now they've killed his only his only his well beloved son. He will come. This is the the, the 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 he will come and destroy the husbandman, and will give the vineyard unto others. In Matthew's account, the religious leaders. Respond to the question. Matthew twenty one forty one, and they say unto him. Now this is the religious leaders talking, and they're saying he was he the father will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard to other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their season. In seventy A.D., Roman general uh, the Roman general destroyed the city of uh, Titus, I believe destroyed the city of Jerusalem and drove the Jews out of Israel as, as, a, as a people. The Jews did not return as, as, a, as a people. I mean, I think there's always been some Jews in Israel. Even during the Ottoman Empire reign, 500 years, Jews lived in Jerusalem, a few, you know, not, the, the, the Ottomans didn't have any problem with them living there. But there was no, no nation, it was gone. Uh, and the Jews were driven out, so, uh, and they didn't return to the land really uh, as a nation until 1948, when the, you know they were recognized as a back as a as a nation, United Nation, yeah. So, uh, and uh, they're in the land. They're not in right now. They're not in all the land that was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They've never been in all the land. And they certainly aren't living there in peace. I mean, they got rockets coming over their fences every day from Gaza. So, verse 10. Shall we stop it there? What do we got there? Okay, let's... Yeah, we just hit yeah, a little bit. All right. And you have not... Verse 10. So the Lord's speaking to them now. They answered that. They said, oh, we're going to do this to that. that. 
that uh, father, this is the uh, religious leaders, the, that uh, father whose son was killed, they ought to come and tear, get rid of those people. <laughs> In verse 10, so the Lord says this after they're done talking, and have you not read the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner? And this was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. Uh, the head cornerstone. Psalm 8, 118, 22, and 23, the stone which the builders refused has become the head of the corner. This is all prophecy. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the Lord's doing. A rejected cornerstone, a rejected stone. You go through, you're building a, a, a wall, you're choosing your stones, you're building an arc, you're an arch, you're building stones, you're placing them there, you're choosing them wisely, and you have one stone that uh, the corner is basically a, a decorative thing with a plaque on it. But in those days, it, w it was a stone that was a central part of the structure of, of the structure. It was the chief stone. Maybe the stone upon which all other stones was laid. It was the cornerstone, the starting point, and it had to be, you know, had to be square. If it wasn't a square, I mean, if it was going off that way, you'd have a weird building by the time you got to the end. And so they understood that. And so he knew, and the religious leaders knew that they that they were rejecting him as Messiah. They knew they were rejecting him. Uh, the people, many of the people believed he was the Messiah, but the religious leaders were, were rejecting them. Not all of them. You had people like uh, Joseph of Arimathea, and then you had uh, Nicodemus. Those were two religious leaders that we know, at least at, at, at the burial of the Lord. You know, they were not, they didn't, they didn't assent, uh, consent to all of this that was going to happen. And so they were rejecting him, and uh, so he points out to them. So this, he knew, and the religious leaders knew, that they were rejecting him as the Messiah. And so he points out to them that the one that they are rejecting is going to be the one who is going to be their ultimate leader, the chief cornerstone. He points that out to them. They, they, he says, and he's, he's, he's point, they knew they were rejecting him. And he's telling them, because you're rejecting me, the scriptures is going to point out to you that by rejecting me, you're going to make, I am going to be the one who is eventually going to be the chief cornerstone. First Peter 2, 7 and 8, unto, the, unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient the stone which the builders disallowed, that would be the religious leaders of that day, they disallowed him, they rejected him as the Messiah, they accused him of being everything but the Messiah. And the same is made the head of the corner, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they are also were appointed. And so uh, there are people that uh, actually hate this book. A lot of people, they, and it's a stumbling block for them. It's a, it's a real stumbling block for them. This was the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord finishes his parable by telling them that God is going to make this happen. Which makes it certain that it's going to be happen. Deuteronomy 18.22, when a prophet, the Lord, by the way, was a prophet at this point in time, right? He was a prophet, priest and king. Right now he's in his priestly mode, sitting at the right hand of God. The father making intercession for his, for his children. That's what a priest did in Old Testament times, intercede. Christ is our, inter our intercessor. He's coming again to be king. He's going to set up his kingdom, the, the Jewish kingdom, a thousand year reign of Christ. But, uh, he, uh, but in his earthly ministry, he was really a teacher and a prophet. And so Deuteronomy 18.28, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that thing which the Lord, it is the thing which the Lord had not spoken, but the prophet had spoken presumptuously. Thou shalt be not afraid of him. Every true prophet of the Lord, everything that a true prophet of the Lord says will come to pass. If it doesn't come to pass, he's not a true prophet. 
true prophets of the Lord were 100% accurate. And there was a lot of false prophets. There's a lot of false prophets in, in the world today. All right, verse 12. And so they lay hold on him and they sought. <laughs> they did not going to get him yet. They sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people. For they knew that he had spoken the parable against them, and they left him and went their way. Uh, it was not that the people fully received him as Messiah. You've you got to understand that. This is not a crowd of thousands that are tr true believers in Christ as the Messiah. This is, these are a bunch of people that really, they, 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 were, they believed him as a miracle maker, as a healer. Uh, they, that's what they, uh, he fed them. I mean, he fed them, miraculously fed them. And uh, they, they, they wanted to keep him around for that reason. For that reason. And so uh, the religious leaders couldn't, couldn't do anything right at that time because they feared the crowd would rise up against them if they did anything to him. But they're gonna, that's going to all change, isn't it? It was not that the people fully received him as the Messiah, but rather as a miracle-producing prophet. Later in the week, they would be the same, same people that said, crucify him. And they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and Herodians to catch words, and we'll, we'll pick that up next week.